And I'm thinking of all these ideas and Virgil was able to take all of those ideas and then architect them. Virgil was the heart of this shit, like, you know what I mean? It's like the heart of the whole fashion world. And not just that, it's like just the cool creativity in the man's head, like, it's just different, it's like. He left his imprint. I mean, it's a giant. You know, the whole idea is to tell stories, to open up doors for others, you know, to hopefully change the landscape of art. That's what motivates me. The GQ 2017 International Designer of the Year is Virgil Abloh. Virgil Abloh was one of the most famous designers who ever lived. He created multiple waves of iconic fashion. He became not just an influential designer, but literally one of the most famous fashion designers ever, while also leaving a huge mark in the world of art and music, creating some of the most iconic album covers of the last 15 years and performing as a DJ at music festivals around the world. He was the definition of a Renaissance man, a massively successful artist, and he did it all as he broke down barriers, becoming the first ever black man to work as the artistic director at Louis Vuitton. But how did he get there? What made Virgil so special that everything he worked on became iconic? What were the secrets of his success, and how did he become such a massively influential artist? This is the story of Virgil Abloh. But before I start telling the story, I wanted to let you guys know that the production of this video is only made possible by my brand new jewelry drop, The Spirit of Creativity. I started this brand myself with a mission of creating jewelry that tells a true story, reminding artists, musicians, creators, everybody to just keep moving forward and take the leap to chase your dreams no matter what. We all watch videos about artists succeeding and changing the world, but the most important lesson out of all of that is that success doesn't come without hard work first. And The Spirit of Creativity is a pendant that exists to remind you what you're capable love and to give you the strength to get there. So go to volksgeist.store to get $10 off the Spirit of Creativity pendant for the next two weeks and free shipping in the U.S. forever. Virgil was born in 1980 in Rockford, Illinois, a small city in Illinois that's not really known for much besides industrial jobs and Midwest culture. But his parents met in Accra, Ghana in the 1970s, and they took their future seriously from a young age, with Virgil later talking about how moving to America was always their dream. When they finally settled in Rockford in the late 70s, Virgil's dad worked in the paint factory and his mom was a seamstress, which led to Virgil learning how to use a sewing machine at home as a child. When Virgil described his childhood in Rockford, he called it suburban and awesome. And while his parents did their best to set him up with a promising future in their new country, I think it's safe to say that they never quite imagined him becoming a world famous visual artist and product and fashion designer. Like a lot of immigrants, they had practical goals and they wanted Virgil to be an engineer and find financial success. And Virgil himself was ready to do so. In his own words, coming from an immigrant family, he didn't grow up with a first world understanding of art and fashion. He said, my parents weren't versed in art. I thought art was just a trophy and a symbol of wealth. Virgil was always a pretty dedicated student. He ended up going to college for civil engineering and he graduated with an undergraduate degree and he even got a master's degree in architecture in 2006. His master's thesis included a design for a Chicago skyscraper that curved towards Lake Michigan. But according to Virgil, there was one specific moment that first gave him an interest in fashion. On Virgil's campus at the Illinois Institute of Technology in Chicago, a brand new campus building that combined a student center with a giant steel tube to muffle the noise of the train that ran above the building ended up inspiring Virgil to learn more about fashion and design while he was studying architecture at the same time. So even though Virgil did follow the path his parents laid out for him and he was ready to become an engineer, he ended up chasing many different things while he was in college. As he was working on his degrees, he was also DJing at house parties and small shows under the name Flat White, and he was also designing t-shirts when he could at local Chicago screen printing shops. He also helped make clothes with a Chicago music producer called Jay Boogie and a brand called Custom Kings. And the story goes that that's how Virgil met the artist who would later become his mentor and close friend, helping him change the course of his life and bring his creative vision to the world an artist who Virgil worked so closely with that it would be impossible to not mention, Kanye West. After meeting Kanye in 2002, before he had even released the college dropout, all the way back when Virgil was still in engineering school and Kanye was still a record producer, Kanye's managers coordinated for Virgil to begin assisting with Kanye's branding, and they started a journey that would end with Virgil eventually defining a large portion of Kanye's visual footprint for a long stretch of his career. 
A lot of people think that Virgil first started working with Kanye at the Fendi internship in 2009, or maybe even for the 808s and Heartbreak album art back in 2008. But before all of those iconic visuals, Virgil had a big part in paving the way for Kanye's fashion career as far back as 2004. Because a lot of the time, the story of Kanye's fashion career is told like it was an immediate, you know, out of the blue, insane success. But earlier, you know, years before, he had a number of false starts in fashion. He went down a lot of strange forks in the road. But Virgil was there for all of it. He was gaining valuable experiences while also developing the skills and vision that later made him an icon all on his own. So let's get into what exactly Virgil was doing with Kanye back in 2004. When Kanye was first getting started as a rapper, he went up against a lot of criticism for not just his music, which a lot of industry people didn't like because Kanye didn't really embody the popular gangster image of the time, but also his clothes. But by the time he finally started blowing up in the mid 2000s, his trademark pink polo shirts, the striped sweaters, the backpacks, they became a piece of his brand. They helped him stand out from the crowd. Naturally, he and his team saw an opportunity they could capitalize on, and the brand mascot was born. And Virgil himself had an intern-like position. He was designing mock-ups, using Photoshop, working on colorways and logos. But the main idea was to capitalize on Kanye's unique look and persona by mass-producing peppy clothes like polo shirts, sweaters, jackets, all of those featuring the Kanye Bear logo, where the Lacoste or Ralph Lauren logo would normally be, and they were gonna sell them to the masses, but the brand never launched. Kanye wore the few samples they did make in public just a few times. He wore one in the music video for the new workout plan. He wore a piece in a Boost Mobile commercial he did back then. But much later on, Kanye was quoted as saying, I could have put the bear on tracksuits and made millions, but I'm really dedicated to fashion. Around the same time, Virgil also helped make mock-ups for a potential shoe design that Kanye was interested in. They did over 50 colorways for one design although obviously that shoe also never materialized. These days, Kanye's first brand is all but forgotten outside of strange, shadowy, obscure pages on the internet, and I could barely find any sources as to what these clothes actually looked like, let alone why they didn't end up going into production and why the brand was canceled entirely before it began. But it does seem fair that most likely Kanye just didn't want to cheaply capitalize off logos from his music, but rather he wanted to make a real impact in the fashion industry when he was ready. So before long, Kanye moved away from the preppy fashion style and mascot was forgotten. But just a few years later, Kanye and Virgil were back together working on another brand again. This time it was called Pastel, and it was supposed to be an elevated version of artist merch that would sit somewhere between streetwear and high fashion. And to this day, there are many drafts and illustrations of what exactly Virgil and Kanye worked on together for Pastel around 2007, floating somewhere around the internet. And Virgil even included many designs and mock-ups in his book, Figures of Speech. And there are even some knockoff pastel jackets that you can buy on Grailed or eBay. But again, no pastel pieces ever actually made it to market, although this brand did get a lot closer to actually existing. If you go back and listen to Stronger from Graduation, Kanye actually wraps the name of the brand in the first verse, which is something I'm sure goes right over most people's heads these days. But back then, it's clear Kanye was pretty confident this was his next big move. But it ended up not ever launching. And while both Kanye and Virgil did go on to create fashion at a much larger scale than either of them ever did with Mascot or Pastel, it's pretty inspiring to see that even the most legendary artists and designers had to learn the hard way and fail a few times before reaching their full potential. And it's even crazier to know that all of the learning experiences that led up to Kanye becoming a billionaire fashion icon and Virgil becoming the most famous fashion designer alive, they were both in the room together while they learned all of the groundwork for that success. Virgil's rise to prominence really began in the late 2000s. After directing the art for 808s and Heartbreak, he and Kanye went together to Paris in 2009 to intern at Fendi for $500 a month. And according to Kanye, we didn't do anything. Thing. We didn't know how to make real clothes, we were just happy to have a key card to the office. Literally, they were just doing intern stuff, despite their fame and status back in the US. That being said, once Kanye and Virgil got back to America, they both leveled up majorly, and their shared vision of bringing elevated streetwear to the masses, blurring the lines between high fashion and urban styles, and changing the fashion landscape as a whole, finally took shape after many failed ventures and forgotten designs. Virgil went on to direct and sometimes design the album art 
for many iconic hip hop projects. In 2010, Kanye hired him to be the full-time creative director for Donda, his creative agency that handled packaging, branding, and visuals for countless albums in the early 2010s, including albums by Lil Wayne, Pusha T, Meek Mill, Kanye himself, and many others. In 2011, Virgil did art direction for Watch the Throne, which ended up getting him a Grammy nomination for Best Recording Package. He also designed the art for Kid Cudi's Wizard, after which Kid Cudi said, no matter if he was working with Kanye or if he was doing his own thing, Virgil is always ahead of the curve. And he also helped direct the art for Kanye's beautiful Dark Twisted Fantasy. In Virgil's book Figures of Speech, he included a quote from George Kondo, the artist who painted the cover. He said, Virgil makes things happen, intrinsically knowing that his talent is to move into an electric field and create a transcendent art experience for the people. He even designed the cover for Yeezus, creating one of the most iconic album covers of the 2010s after many different iterations, curating over 10 designers working on Yeezus around the clock, including many test covers and paintings by George Kondo, before eventually Virgil and Joe Perez's minimalistic, basic, clean slate approach helped accompany Kanye's new, abrasive, unprecedented sound. And the album cover for Yeezus basically became a pop art icon all of its own. But at the same time, Virgil's next venture would end up making him a bigger icon than anything he could previously have imagined. Virgil's first big solo project as a fashion designer was Pyrex Vision, which was launched in 2012. It only existed for a year, but Pyrex made a huge impact in streetwear, creating a rough early blueprint of the formula that Virgil would later build upon to become one of the most influential designers alive. Pyrex itself, though, was a strange moment. It essentially came out of nowhere and became extremely popular overnight, in many ways thanks to the industry connections Virgil already had. After Kanye, Jay-Z, Kendrick Lamar, Kylie Jenner, ASAP Rocky, and many many other artists and influencers wore Pyrex in public, it became one of the hottest streetwear brands in just a few months. But Pyrex ended after just a year because it ultimately wasn't a viable business model. But in Virgil's words, it wasn't ever meant to be. It had started as a short film about downtown New York streetwear and rap music, but seeing influential people wear his designs had made Virgil feel like it could be something more. He said it was never intended to even be a clothing line. And the reason why it wasn't a viable business model was pretty Pretty simple. According to a 2021 ASAP Rocky interview, Virgil got a cease and desist from the glass company Pyrex, and ASAP Mob ended up helping him build a vision for a new, better brand. But even more than that, Pyrex, despite its massive popularity and viral success, was built on non-existent manufacturing. The thing about Pyrex pieces is that they were really, really simple. All Virgil did was take blanks from Champion and Ralph Lauren and screen print Renaissance paintings on the front and Pyrex in blocky letters on the back. And the prices Virgil was charging meant that he didn't even have to buy the blanks wholesale. He could literally go buy them at the store and still make a 1000% profit. In the example of one particular flannel that Pyrex sold for $550 a piece, it was based on a $35 blank from Ralph Lauren. And people discovered that the shirt Virgil was using was never available for wholesale to begin with. He was literally buying blanks for the brand at retail at the store and making hundreds of dollars of profit by screen printing pictures and words on the front and back. And craziest of all, he was using a brand name he didn't legally own. He was using shirts that weren't his. He was using designs that were made by someone else. But many people saw it as being deeper than that. And in order to explain what I mean, I'm gonna share a section of a 2021 article that I love that was written by New York designer Mark Sabino, and it goes like this. High fashion was still at its most gatekept, its most exclusive, and above all, its whitest, when Pyrex first hit the scene. By charging hundreds for a champion hoodie, it wasn't so much an act of trying to pull a fast one on the consumer, the brand of hoodie was right there on the sleeve, but rather a larger statement to the higher ups who determined what was and wasn't fashion. The Pyrex hoodie takes the idea of what high fashion is and upends it entirely. It asks, what draws the line between a $600 Givenchy hoodie and a $500 Champion hoodie? Is it the person making it, where and how it's presented, or who is wearing it? All through the simple act of pricing and marketing. Virgil took the tropes that were so stigmatized and forced onto an entire race and put them on a billboard that you can wear around, while also making a statement through the garment itself. And that's just the back half. To talk about the front of the hoodie, we need some art history help. The front graphic is the famous painting, The Entombment of Christ, by Italian artist Caravaggio again blown up to a massive size. The importance of this painting as a graphic doesn't lie with the subject of the painting itself, but rather the artist. Caravaggio was infamous for his lifestyle when he wasn't creating stunning commissions for the Italian elites. 
usually hanging around the streets and taverns of Rome with alleged criminals and other people that Italian high society deemed unsavory. Does this sound familiar yet? The choice to use not only a famous piece of European art as a graphic on a piece of streetwear, but specifically Caravaggio, was more than deliberate. Caravaggio's paintings were famous for their use of chiaroscuro, the technique of using high contrast between dark and light to create heavy emphasis in the composition. What better representation of the sterile old guard of white high fashion clashing with the supposed lesser than black streetwear could there be? Both the fashion and art worlds are notoriously Eurocentric, and by plastering a famous Italian painting as if it were a logo on the front of an article of clothing deemed primarily for thugs and gangsters, it creates a new concept context for the work entirely. And that idea in itself ended up leaving an artistic legacy that would last for years and years to come. While some people called Virgil an intelligent commentator on the state of fashion, other people called his prices and manufacturing a big fuck you to streetwear customers. Either way, Virgil's reputation was growing. He knew how to build hype, he knew how to sell clothes, and he was developing a formula of reinterpreting familiar ideas that would end up becoming huge. So over 10 years after beginning his education in engineering, finding inspiration while at school, working on two different now forgotten clothing projects with Kanye, becoming the creative director at Donda, helping shape the visual identity of so many classic albums, Virgil was finally on the verge of becoming the most prominent fashion designer alive. So after just a year, Pyrex was ended. There were legal issues and controversy, and it just didn't make sense to continue using that name. But not long after, another project, which would become the biggest thing Virgil ever worked on, was born. Off-White was founded in Milan, Italy in 2013, in a much, much more official capacity than Pyrex. Virgil himself had been a student for a long time, working under other artists and contributing to larger projects, sometimes while going to college for over 10 years. And now in 2013, at the age of 32, after being patient and learning for so long, it was finally time for Virgil to step out on his own and change fashion forever. His vision of disrupting the world of luxury was about to finally become reality. So Off-White was funded and launched in part by the New Guards Group, a big fashion production and distribution company that also helped start other brands like Heron Preston and Palm Angels. And as soon as it was launched, it was a huge success on the street and in the world of high fashion. And Off-White was again a fairly minimalistic brand that at first followed a lot of the same principles that Virgil had come up with while working on Pyrex. They dropped flannels, jackets, t-shirts, sweaters, and even pants with the blocky Off-White text and either a white square made of four arrows or a square made of thick white diagonal lines, which according to Virgil's book was a way of crossing out the numbers from the Pyrex brand and starting over. He also wrote, what I loved about the diagonal is that it reads as off-white from a block away. The pieces that blew up and became so hyped and desired and copied that Virgil became a legend in just a few years, the key ingredients were pretty simple. It was zip ties, air quotes, big blocky graphics of arrows and barricade tape. So how did it end up blowing up so quickly and what did it mean? Because after just a few short years, Off-White had over a dozen flagship stores on four continents. They had pieces in every high-end retailer in the world. They had runway shows at Paris Fashion Week and a laundry list of major commercial collaborations. Off-White was a true marriage between streetwear and high fashion. It made Virgil one of the most famous fashion designers alive after just a few years, and it also delivered on a lot of the ideas he began developing much, much earlier. But what made Virgil's style so engaging? It wasn't uniqueness, it wasn't originality. Virgil Abloh's work was something else. He had a way of taking something we already know, something simple and regular, and making it new without changing all that much of the original piece underneath. The goal of a lot of projects Virgil worked on wasn't to create anything new in essence, but to package familiar objects in a new way, which I think ended up being ultimately the key to his success. Virgil called his philosophy of design the 3% rule, and he's talked openly about how it was majorly inspired by the work of a French artist named Marcel Duchamp, who was born in 1888 and was active in art until the late 1960s, and he was a huge pioneering force behind how we think of and understand art in general to this day. And Marcel Duchamp's most famous piece is a urinal. But more than just being a toilet, it serves as the basis of what Virgil would come along and do to the world of fashion about a hundred years later. In in 1917, he submitted a porcelain urinal to the Society of Independent Artists, and while most people were shocked by Marcel trying to pass off a urinal as a piece of art, 
He called it an everyday object raised to the dignity of a work of art by the artist's act of choice. His ideas were part of a European avant-garde movement called Dadaism, which was often described as anti-art. They challenged the traditionally accepted definition of what art is, and they brought into question the idea of how much an artist has to physically do versus how much the artist's intention can be the driving force for how a piece should be received. Because Marcel didn't build this urinal, he bought it and wrote his name on it. So is the pre-made urinal just a pre-made urinal? Or could adding a signature and putting it on a pedestal make it something else entirely? Marcel and his peers, of course, created many other pieces that represented a similar idea. One of his works was a Mona Lisa with a mustache drawn on it, and a snow shovel with the words Marcel Duchamp 1915 painted on the handle. And the way that Virgil took this idea and adapted it to sit at the core of almost all his work was simple. Even back at the beginning of Virgil's career with Pyrex, when he was printing an Italian Renaissance era painting on a hoodie and selling them for $250 a piece, he didn't create the painting or the hoodie, but he did create a new meaning by combining both. But probably the most hyped moment of Virgil's entire off-white career, and also the biggest and best manifestation of the 3% rule, was his collaboration with Nike called The Ten. And this collection of shoes truly made Virgil a star. Off-White was already popular. Pieces like the Industrial Belt, the Mona Lisa hoodie, the Montclair collaboration, the collection with Levi's, the logo tees, the flannels, these were all pretty highly desirable and very expensive at retail, and even more so secondhand. Off-White was really making Virgil's goal of bringing high fashion and streetwear together come true. Off-White did runway shows in Italy and France, and it was also popular on social media, and it was worn by rappers and influencers at the same time. Virgil was already arguably the most famous designer in the world, but the 10 sneaker collection, a collaboration with the biggest sneaker company on earth, still took him to a new level. The 10 was introduced in August of 2017, with Nike's press release saying that Virgil's relationship to Nike began long before he first visited the company's world headquarters in October 2016 to start a new collaboration. They wrote, as a teenager living in Rockford, Illinois, Virgil and his friends sketched shoe ideas and mailed them to Nike. They unveiled 10 shoe designs split into two groups, revealing and ghosting, with the first group designed to look hand-cut and reconstructed, and the second group designed with translucent uppers around the idea of exposing different materials. Virgil said this, in one gesture, I wanted to underscore how the design system and manufacturing of Nike are so perfect. By combining these shoes with design that amplifies their handmade quality, we're intensifying the human element and expanding the emotional connection of these 10 icons. The shoes in the collection were some of Nike's most famous, the Jordan 1, the Air Max 90, the Presto, the Vapormax, Blazer, Converse Chuck Taylor, Zoomfly, Air Force One, Hyperdunk, and Air Max 97. And all of these sneakers ended up being some of the most desirable products Virgil ever designed. Even though he barely changed the original ingredients, maybe altering 3% of the product itself, he created a new perspective and made a massive impact in sneaker culture. And the wildest thing of all was that the Nike X Off-White collab came at exactly the right moment. When Kanye signed his shoe deal with Adidas and dropped the Yeezy Boosts back in 2014, the hype and frenzy around those shoes was insane. It was crazy. And Nike needed an answer for that excitement because they didn't have anything with that much trend or hype at the time. And their answer to that problem ended up being Virgil Abloh himself, the same person who helped Kanye lay the groundwork for what would later become Yeezy back in the mid-2000s when they were working together on Pastel and Mascot in Chicago. On a technical level, all Virgil really did to the Nike 10 was cut them up, add words to the side, put a zip tie through the eyelet, and sometimes change some stitching or a few materials. But it was also deeper than that. The design and choices behind these shoes is really fascinating. For the Air Max 90, Virgil used exposed stitching, a new range of fabrics, a distorted tongue, and text on the outside to turn one of the most recognizable sneaker silhouettes into something completely new without really changing much at all. The same went for the Jordan 1 Chicago. He essentially turned it inside out, with rough edges and rawness exposing the shoe's inner materials and turning it into a fascinating art piece that tells a story as much as it is a wearable shoe. Shoes like the Presto and the Vapor Max included distressed tongues. All of them had labels printed on the side in Virgil's favorite font, Helvetica, and many of them were defined by having their core elements turned inside out, giving the shoe a completely new look despite being not all that different from the original at all. 
Virgil's Nike designs told a story about the design of the shoe, and he somehow did all of that while still keeping them essentially the same. During an interview from just a few months after the shoes were released and Virgil's hype had never been higher, Tom Betridge wrote this. He said, Virgil Abloh looks back at the dawn of his streetwear era as a consumer revolt, a shift where the purchaser is placed at the helm of the machinery that produces culture. The only tools necessary are a smartphone, a screen printer, and a box of blank t-shirts. On a footstool beside us, Virgil rests his feet in a pair of sneakers he just designed for Nike, a modified and deconstructed version of the Air Force One. On the shoelace, the word shoelace is written in Helvetica with quotation marks. Helvetica is present in almost everything Ablo does, a nod to the tradition of modernist design that he became fascinated with while studying architecture. He describes Marcel Duchamp as his lawyer, the art historical grounds onto which he can absorb pre-existing intellectual property into his reference system. He rejects the who did it first mentality of the previous generations in favor of the copy and paste logic of the internet. The off-white Nike collaboration became so popular that the original shoes go for thousands of dollars a pair today. They became some of the most iconic and most hyped shoes of the last 10 years, but most of all, Virgil's 3% rule truly came to life after these shoes became so popular, with him creating an entirely new product without changing much of the original ingredients at all. After the off-white Nike collaboration, there was almost nowhere else for Virgil to go. I wouldn't say his popularity peaked, but rather, there was almost no more popularity left for him to achieve. Off-white arguably made Virgil the most famous fashion designer in the world. So what was there left for him to do? Well, I think it was pretty obvious. After years of bringing together the world of high fashion and streetwear as an outsider, as a kind of pirate, doing things on his own terms, he was called up by the powers that be to work as the artistic director of menswear at Louis Vuitton. He was the first ever African-American to work as the artistic director at any luxury French fashion house, and things only went up from there. His first collection for LV debuted in Paris at the 2018 Men's Fashion Week show and it featured 56 pieces focusing on reimagining accessories with a wide variety of color schemes. Many of the guests at the show were students, with Virgil writing in an Instagram post, like some kids today, I started the surreal mission without fashion school, but with a blank t-shirt, a screen printed idea, and a dream. The soundtrack at the show included Kanye's I Thought About Killing You, and some of the models that walked the runway included Playboy Cardi, Steve Lacey, and Kid Cudi. The Fashion Week 2020 collection called Heaven on Earth was another interesting one, featuring suits with printed clouds and close tailoring and uninhibited design. Throughout the next few years, Virgil became more prolific than he ever had been before. He designed the dress that Serena Williams wore while playing at the 2018 US Open, he did a luggage collaboration with Rimowa, he did a range of pieces with Ikea including a clock, chairs, tables, and a backlit light box version of the Mona Lisa, and of course, the legendary receipt rug. Obviously, everything sold out instantly, and most of the pieces resell for thousands just a few years later. For the fall-winter 2021 Louis Vuitton menswear collection, he made oversized puffer jackets wrapped in 3D models of iconic buildings from different world cities. He made a custom, one-off Mercedes G-Wagon. He made recycled plastic bottles for Evian. He even raised millions for a fashion scholarship to assist black students. Virgil was so popular and so well-loved that him joining LV as the artistic director of menswear led to 20% in sales growth. And he did all of this among many other awards, art shows, achievements, and creations, while also continuing to work in the music industry, designing cover art for artists like Pop Smoke and West Side Gun, while also playing as a DJ at many festivals and shows. But then, on November 28th, 2021, Virgil died unexpectedly at the age of 41. He left behind his wife, who he had been with since high school, and their two kids. He had been battling a rare form of blood cancer for over two years, but he kept the diagnosis private and had continued working like normal while going through treatment. The legacy that Virgil left behind is unmatched. He really did change fashion forever. From Kanye to Pyrex to Off-White to Louis Vuitton, the impact he made is clear. He conquered the world of fashion by bringing streetwear and high fashion together, achieving the highest honor in a world he had joined by accident, working as Kanye's creative assistant while he was still in college for engineering. But there wasn't one way he did it. Most of what Virgil made didn't have a specific look other than his trademark letters and graphics, but rather he had a specific way of looking at things. He wasn't limited to one style or one specific artistic medium. Virgil had a method that could be applied to and was applied to an endless variety of objects and images. 
But more than anything, Virgil had a goal that went above fashion or music or design, and I think it was the biggest project he ever worked on. The deeper meaning behind almost everything Virgil worked on and the way he structured his projects was to inspire. Behind every piece, every brand, and every project, Virgil talked about inspiring young people, and he wanted to show us what we're all capable of. The entire time that he was succeeding as an artist who could do anything, who could make anything and put his name on whatever he wanted, and have people line up just to get the chance to buy it, he reminded the world that his number one motivation as an artist was to open doors for people like him, immigrants, African Americans, young people of any kind who have dreams to create and make an impact. His entire career-long project and his goal of breaking down barriers was to allow fashion to be for everybody, especially the people for who it had never been for before. He made an entire website open to everybody called Free Game, teaching young people step-by-step -step how to build brands. He released a book with all of his notes, hundreds and thousands of paragraphs about his designs and his experiences. Virgil wasn't mysterious, he wasn't elusive, he wasn't silent or pretentious. He broke down barriers by constantly sharing how he was doing what he was doing and why. It seems to be the case, even though I think a lot of people may not agree with this, that putting paintings on hoodies and everything he ever did after that was a lot more than a get-rich-quick scheme. It was a way of making the world belong to him, but not by designing a new one. Instead, Virgil took the world as it was and he added himself to it. One of the many young designers that Virgil mentored wrote this. He said, Virgil's presence has been a continuous, constant guiding light throughout my formative years within the fashion and design industries. And in a way, Virgil's work can remain forever as a testament to that idea. Because behind his fashion, art, and design empire, there was nothing, just Virgil. Anyone can make nice clothes, but Virgil was more than that. He was a shining teaching figure for artists everywhere. With his parents having grown up in Ghana, making it to the US and having their son succeed in engineering school was already a dream come true. But for Virgil to become so popular, to become the most famous fashion designer alive, yes, it was dependent on his work being good enough to capture the attention of the public, but none of that would have ever been possible if he weren't driven by a relentless work ethic and a sense of creative freedom unlike anyone else. And I started this channel as a way to make art mean something. All the artists I've covered have changed the world in some way, but they all have one thing in common. They all had to take the first leap and push forward through doubt and uncertainty to become who they are today. They had to believe. Virgil, Kanye, SZA, Kendrick Lamar, no one had their success handed to them. Everyone has to take the leap. And that's something that doesn't get talked about enough these days. So often today we talk about artists' success through numbers and money and popularity, but we almost always forget what it takes to get there. And because of that, it can be hard to find inspiration. It can be hard to feel creative. But the first drop from my new brand is called The Spirit of Creativity, and it tells the story of every artist. It's a solid silver surreal bird with blue gemstone eyes and sleek recursive wings, and it represents the journey of the artist, the student, the entrepreneur. Whatever your dream is, the way that the bird flies through a dark night sky with silver stars tells a story about always moving forward, representing the idea of working to achieve your goals even when it feels impossible to keep going, because that's when it matters most. Creativity and art isn't supposed to be easy. Meaningful art doesn't just get made without meaningful work behind it. We're all sitting here watching videos about successful artists, people who change the world. But I want to motivate all of you to pursue your own dreams and never give up. It can go where you go and remind you to let yourself dream big the way everyone deserves to feel free to do. So if you want to support my new brand and invest in a piece of high quality silver jewelry that represents something real and tells a true story, go to volkskeist.store and buy the spirit of creativity now. For the next two weeks only, the necklaces will be $10 off. And as always, all orders in the US get free shipping as well as a silver Rolo chain included with the Pendant. This has been the story of Virgil. I'm Philip, and this is Volksgeist.